Hello then, welcome to the Drex Files Radio Hour with Joe Yardley. My name is Drex Dupre and with me is uh, Joe Yardley. Hi Joe, how are you doing? Hello, uh, I'm alright, besides it being too hot. I know, you gotta, you gotta g kind of um, work during in the night, I guess. Yeah, I'm trying to sleep as much as I can during the day because it's, uh, it's almost 20 degrees. Today on the show, uh, I'm going to uh, report a little bit from a country or a state in a country where there, where it's way more than 20 degrees um, Celsius, God. by the way. God. It's called California, and it is the, uh, the haven for the VR movement. I've heard of it. So, as you know, um, I was at the Silicon Valley Virtual Reality Conference in San Jose, and today we, as the title of the show suggests, we're going to be talking about High Fidelity, Philip Rosedale's new open source VR world. That's what they actually say on their T-shirt, open source VR. And uh, we'll speak to Brett Heftegau, a developer at HiFi, and Ozan Serum, who is in charge of avatars there, and who scanned me into High Fidelity. And also we'll talk to Kelly Tony from Upload VR Collective, which is a space in San Francisco that you can rent and hang out with other geeks uh, coding things. And I actually met Dr. Fran Babcock of uh, Second Life fame there and a whole bunch of other defectors from Second Life who are now in high fidelity. Exclusively? <laughs> no, no, no. They're still, I think they're still hopping. They're still world hopping. Uh, um, that's what I thought. Also, as you can see on the blog, there's a photo of... Um, a furry on a beam robot. Those are these little robots that you can steer rem uh, from a remote location. It has two cameras, and it has a little uh, monitor where you can sort of interact with with other people, a real life avatar, if you will. But it's a robot. While I was talking to Philip Rosedale at High Fidelity, the beam robot comes up to me, and says, "Is this Dragster?" And he totally, this furry totally uh, recognized me, although I was only there uh, with my physical self. So did you, did you interview anyone else outside of High Fidelity? Yeah, I bumped into Jinsu Yoon, formerly Jinsu Linden, really great conversation, and also Timony West from Unity. Uh, you remember her, she gave that demo um, uh, where she's inside of Unity building the world. And also I talked to Monica Joe, who curates a VR museum. She was married in cyberspace in 1996. Well, that's impossible because there was no VR because the Oculus Rift had not yet been invented. Exactly. <laughs> I, I was under the impression the VR started in 2013. Yeah. By a, a young lad. It. In a garage. So, uh, well, anyway, how, how was the show? What was the best thing you saw there? Well, the best thing, and also we're going to dole out the audio over the next we uh, few weeks, the best thing was definitely Project Alice, and we're linking to a video also um, on the blog. It's it's a company called Neutome, and they um, kind of jerry-rig a whole bunch of things together to create a space where you interact with physical objects, like a chair or just like a piece of foam uh, that you can hold in your hand. You are in a virtual room, and virtual objects appear and disappear, and you can create virtual objects with the uh, Vive uh, controllers, but you can also interact with those physical objects because they're tracked in that same room. That sounds interesting. That is absolutely amazing, and 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 possibly the future. If you can, if you imagine, you can set that up in the in in your little home studio, and you can create physical objects that are tracked. Um, and you can interact with them like your chair, your sofa, and they just become other things. It's just basically like in Rainbow's End in a, in a way. I mean, this is this is the VR version of AR because you're still completely um, immersed in a virtual space. So, you know, th these are these two different approaches to, to the future. Either you kind of decorate real life or you bring real life into the virtual world, I guess, is is all the two different um, approaches. Yeah. Uh, Infinadec was there. We talked about it. That's that huge, bulky, omnidirectional treadmill. Yeah. Mm, to be honest with you, it doesn't quite work yet. And it's, I think, still two tons in, in weight. <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, it's already smaller than its previous version. And yeah. I think I think the best thing about the, the Infinadec is not... Um, is not how it works now, but the very simple, basic, yet brilliant idea behind it, these two treadmill things that sort of are in interwoven. I think that's the best way to describe it. Yeah, and the, the solid sort of the solid uh, nature of the thing versus the Cyberith um, Virtualizer or the, the uh, Virtrix Omni, 
it yeah. is kind of appealing because you can really, I mean, it's really sturdy, you know, it's like built for war. But the Infinia deck, uh, Infinia deck is, is actually, an, in, you know, an omnidirectional treadmill. It is what it says. Everything else is just, um, you know, just a bowl of plastic where you're sliding around on your socks yeah. or something like that. There's, there is no real omnidirectional treadmill except the Infinidex. So That's I their think, real selling point, actually, that you can yeah. run with, with regular shoes and, uh, you know, whatnot. Yeah, it is an actual, it is what it says. So I, I think that the technology here or the idea is what's going to be big. But right now it is too big, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, but I, th I think this is, you know, we have to keep an eye on it. I, I can already hear people, uh, our regular listeners uh, who uh, are Second Life residents and who uh, are not, um, I don't know, for whatever reason, not very interested in, in VR or the or the surrounding sort of gear, uh, uh, sort of fetishizing over gear. Go like, oh, my God, is this going to be an hour again, like on like what I can't afford? Um, <laughs> no, it won't be. Uh, we'll be talking about virtual worlds and we're going to be talking about the metaverse as indicated high fidelity mainly but also contextual because i want to know from you uh, joe what we learned from um ebbe from project sansar and he gave another interview by the way to voices of vr yeah uh which is also really interesting because he, he goes into detail about privacy and stuff like that but anyway two quick things from um the conference uh also what was interesting there was a 360 video camera from nokia which cost sixty thousand dollars oh that's fun yeah and people may know that i purchased a rico theta uh i already posted some unlisted fun uh, little videos it's, it's total fun to shoot in 360 and you upload it to youtube and frankly um i didn't see a big difference between the rico what comes out of the rico and what comes out of the 60k camera at least on the display devices, you know, obviously it's uh, 4K resolution and all that, but um, what what is what can be consumed? Uh, pff, I don't think it makes a difference to any of the uh, run-of-the-mill consumers. Yeah. All right. Before we go to the bulk of the show, I want to uh, because we haven't done that for a while. Acknowledge all our sponsors real quick because it's, it's this is a community uh, show and. It's a, it's 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 a community effort in the sense that we want to be um, delivering content for the Second Life community plus the periphery in the VR world, and our sponsors make this possible because it's a lot of work that goes into these shows. Our sponsors: the Cube Republic, Astro Boy, Extraordinary Fine Magical Goods, Ionic, You Know for Kids, Maven Homes. All right, so you can go in and shop for all these, for all these brands. Giza Creations, thank you. Botanical, Strawberry Sing, thank you. Uh, a brand animations, 10 years in Second Life. Arrows Avatars, Carvel Design. Uh, Justin makes these awesome thumbnails every week. Um, the Avazines Publication Family, What Next? My favorite store, Dutchie. Yay. A Dutch person. Yay. Oh, my God. Uh, Landscapes Unlimited, Dwarfins, Fallen Gods Incorporated, and Ferocious SL and Death Row Designs and Avacon. Thank you so much. Those are our corporate sponsors. You you can become an individual subscriber for a hundred Linden dollars per month and support this show. It is important. Every Linden dollar counts. It makes this show possible. And if you want to purchase I want I want to believe shirt, go to the Drax merch store now and pick up one and uh, and gift a whole bunch of others to to your friends. Now Joe, I saw, and you've been uh, annoying the hell out of me, tell, asking me what I saw in Project Sansar that I can yes. talk about. Yes, tell us more. I cannot talk about anything. <sighs> it's completely secret. So we're going to be talking about High Fidelity Blog of the Show, but let's start with what What do you think? Well, you moderated Lab Chat la uh, last week, and what have you learned about Sansa in a nutshell? What what uh, is exciting to you and what uh, what worries you? It's not that much is new, actually. I mean, we've seen more screenshots, which is, of course, exciting. We've seen a video now, which is also quite nice. You know, we see some wonderful wind light settings, if if that's what we're going to call them in Sansa. Um, we know that the cinema is wonderfully art decoy from uh, on the inside. And it's already being used to watch uh, videos or films. I hope, you know, we saw a little bit of Captain America Civil War. 
So I'm I'm hoping the copyrights are all in order there <laughs> for showing that in the, in Sensar or Sansar. Okay, but we see all you know. Okay, we they built a render engine that looks good and is on par with yeah. with what's out there. But are you not worried that there is no in world building? Absolutely. I mean, we've seen we've seen someone um, well building an experience. That's what we're calling it now. Um, by moving stuff around, which they probably bought somewhere online or downloaded or whatever. Um, but we're yet to see someone actually create in-world. And that may not be, you know, important to a lot of users. But, um, you know, I think it is important to those users who've made much of Second Life. So, or, you know, it is important to those who are going to make experiences that are a little bit more than just stuff that you've bought and moved around a bit. Not saying that you can't make a fantastic virtual experience with things that you're just moving around. I mean, you're creating an atmosphere, a setting, um, you know, a place. You can do that with things. But if you want to build something unique uh, that's in your head the way it is in your head, for instance, you know, like my 1920s Berlin, you need to be able to make your own things. Then you have to uh, learn Blender, Joe. Yes, well, and that's been causing my brain to leak and explode on several occasions. And, um, you know, all I know is that if I've joined Second Life now and realized that if, or, you know, if I've joined Sansar completely blank as a new user and I thought to myself, I want to build 1920s Berlin. And I then had to go out of Sansar, download uh, Blender and figure it out. I would not have started on 1920s Berlin. End of story. There would be no 1920s Berlin. So, you know, I'm I'm a little bit worried that there will not be building tools for uh, the simple-minded people like me who just can't really figure out Blender or, you know, who aren't keen on, on spending that much time and effort on, on trying to learn it. Linden Lab would say, well, but you want high visual fidelity then you yeah. need to uh, do what's necessary. The high visual fidelity uh, is not achievable with in-world building tools at this point. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite happy with uh, some of the things that I've built in Berlin mm -hmm. recently. I think they look pretty nice. And that was all built in-world with Prims and then converted into mesh. Now, even, if, if, even if we had that basic old system from Second Life in Sansar, uh, you know, I could already build a lot of stuff. And I also know that a lot of users, even if they're not, you know, creating massive, brilliant, amazing things, they, you know, they enjoy being together and building a few, you know, resing a few cubes to sit on or just building a simple house or, you know, little things just for fun. Not, not, not everyone wants to build this amazing experience, but lots of people want to build. Um, you know, it would be have a bit of fun. I mean, it's one of the first things I did when I joined Second Life, and it is still one of the things I like the most: building. There is no doubt in my mind that that what you're describing, uh, even when you hear the argument, often well, there's maybe one person who is a creator, and the others are j just uh, moving furniture around. That just just the act of building or putting Lego blocks onto each other, or or I don't know, building in an actual sandbox, you know, children on the beach or whatever, is is such a completely important experience, but uh, so I. But I don't know if Linden Lab has sort of uh, said uh, uh, definitively that they will not pursue this. And later, a little bit, we hear hear from Brad from High Fidelity. He's he's going to make a statement in 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 that regard as well. Um, I don't know if they definitively said this is this is not what we're going to pursue. I think they they made or Ebbe made some comments where they say well they're taking it slow uh step by step and and maybe add that later or i mean uh it, i i don't i don't think we have to have it right now but i do think that it is something that we need when you know when when sunset goes public because that is what makes it unique um you know you want to Im imagine being able to build a just a cube in vr how many how many vr applications right now are there where you can build your own um, surrounding, where you can just build a cube, even just a simple cube and stretch it. I mean, there's a few, but that is, that is a fantastic experience. That is, you know, many people who are now in VR who are experiencing the most amazing graphic games that are fantastic. 
um, they hear about sun, so they think, oh, that's related to second life. That's probably not going to be very exciting. So they're just going to try it, have a little look around. Um, they're going to see a few experiences that they say, yeah, that, that's nice. I've, I've, you know, that's okay. Um, and then maybe they'll leave again. But if they are there and then they realize, hang on, I could build my own VR experience, Look, I can build a, a cube, and I build another cube, and then I've got a, a little room I can walk in. We're linking to uh, the uh, Voices of VR podcast from uh, our friend Kent Bai, where Ebbe makes some really great statements in regards to that, uh, you know, giving the, the, the regular, I don't know how he phrases it, but uh, regular people outside of the professional development community tools uh, that they can be at the table. And that kind of democratization is, is key. But like you said, to me and to you and to many others, this would be more than shifting furniture around that you purchase off a marketplace from a professional because that that would be almost i don't know it's not the same thing it's it's one step better and i'm not dismissing that i i have made episodes in the drax files uh, myself where i made the argument um that this is a very creative act but to freely build and by the way again i mean this can be achieved in unity if you want to learn it which I think is their main competitor. That's just my two cents on this. Um, so I think uh, they need to be um, thinking hard about uh, about pursuing this in, in the long term. Find some way to, for collaborative uh, building. Absolutely. And the thing is, they keep using words like building tools and things like that. Uh, but then you see the video and then they're not... Well, they're not building; they're moving stuff around. Yeah, yeah, so, but yes, that's why they're not yes, there you yet. Can, you, know, you can build your own experience, but you can't build any things yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the question now is, how important is it? There are many people who say it's not important at all because there's only su there's such a small minority of people who are building, uh, and they'll be they'll they won't mind using Blender. But you know, I think that lowering the threshold. Uh, is only a good thing. Anyway, we'll see what happens. I mean, right now, what's to me very exciting in, in virtual reality is the is the tilt brush application where you can freely paint in the room and you can be, we linked to that uh, video a long time ago, but it that is a very powerful experience. And I would be hard pressed. I mean, it's it, it would be naive to, to think that nobody is pursuing something like that where you can basically paint in the air um, and create things that you can use in some sort of world and 3D print and all the rest of it. I mean, this is the next logical step in my mind. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to mention the video again. <laughs> world builders? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that, I mean, that's the ultimate future, basically. That's well, yeah. I, want. I want to be standing in Sansar and I'm just going to go move my hand and a little palette opens up and I can click a, a cube and then with my fingers, I'm going to make it smaller and bigger and stretch it and put a texture on it and things like that. And But the question is, will we be able to do it in some sort mm -hmm. or will eventually someone else come along and say, uh, you can do that in our virtual world? Well, I'm rooting for the team. I'm yeah. rooting for the team. Sure. I have the colors. I'm sitting here decked out in fan gear and I'm rooting for the team. Come on, put pedal to the metal. Well, you know, they, they are in the best position because they with all this experience that they've got from, you know, 13 years of second life uh, this month next month um they you know they they have an amazing chance to be uh, at at the front to be the the, the arrow the arrow point, point yeah arrow. and and you know to be quite honest i mean again as you mentioned uh sl13 uh, b let's mention this real quick we link to it on the um, on the blog uh participate please in the second life birthday um celebrations it's always an awesome thing and and the applications are open now people are building this is a community celebration that shows the best of second life i i hope to be streaming from from the uh, event i need to be streaming daily yeah we signed up as well and you know if they will have us if they allow us um we'll we'll represent 1920s berlin there as well so i don't think it's pg-13 so you can't i don't know if they take 1920s berlin well i don't know either but we've been we've been we've been handing out schnapps to people there at sl uh, birthdays for a few years now so just don't tell anyone what what you're saying also i mean we we, we say this every time uh 
I think um, current VR developers should really study Second Life really quite closely, especially, yes. again, going back to SVVR. I saw a few things. Uh, alt space, and I'm vocal about it. I, I I don't understand alt space. I don't understand the appeal because to me this is kind of a step backwards. Uh, because you know th they're very rudimentary avatars, and their selling point is you can hang out and watch movies together. Yeah, that's one cool thing. Yeah, but <laughs> you know, they're they, always... and, and and also let let me just say that they they bring in you know high profile um, comedians and musicians. But again, it 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 create it, it keeps that um, that hierarchy going where there is the the performer, the the well known performer, and the rest is sort of the audience. And Second Life flipped that around by making everyone, at least in theory, someone who could perform for others. Yeah, and we no, we are worrying about some are not having creative building tools, but you know, every other virtual world that's popping up now uh, doesn't have any. So you know that's ah uh, well. Listen to VR chat. I was I changed my mind on VR chat. I have a quick soundbite uh, from uh, SVR uh, about but, but, VR chat. Yeah, but but people have to uh, study Second Life a little bit anyway because you can at least avoid them calling whatever they've invented uh, calling it the first of something. <laughs> <laughs> that's certainly true. <laughs> uh, let, let's qu uh, quickly go through um, and again we'll link to the video Ebe um, talking at the Collisions Conference in uh, New Orleans because. Because that has the uh, Sansar video in, in more high resolution. Uh, we'll link to it again. But you um, you linked some. Uh, you sent me something here, which is absolutely amazing. Because I've been experimenting with 360 video, just sort of on the home video uh, front, and it's so much fun. And you sent me something from from uh, War Gaming, which is the company that makes. Uh, what is that? What are the games that they make? Like uh, Tank War or something? Yeah, it's it's just uh, lots of strategic games and uh, shooters and things like that. Right, they make World of Warplanes, World of Tanks, and World of Warships. Yes, very original names. Exactly, but can't. But I gotta hand it, and you you sent me an upload VR article, and I have to agree with the guy. I did not expect a game company that makes war gaming. Uh, or war games to to create really the most thrilling exciting 360 video that i have seen yet and it's you know it, it is 360 video but it's partially that's right sort of a little bit vr right there's game footage there's in-game footage so they reenact movie scenes of various countries getting ready for war and there is a considerable amount of extras involved there's a considerable amount of very good set design frankly well i'm you I'm, disagree <laughs> <laughs> i'm an historical consultant for film and television so i have to admit that um here and there, I saw a few mistakes. And okay, a few so for Joe, it's at the <laughs> for Joe, it's at the level of community <laughs> theater, and for me, no, no, as no, a no, 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 generally, it is pretty good, mm -hmm. yeah, and indeed very impressive. And you know, a few historical mistakes is to be, uh, you know, ex expected if you, uh, you know, if you don't hire someone like me. We see but, we see uh, troops running in a village, getting on the wagon. We see uh, we see uh, the British troops going on a train. We see uh, Americans uh, hearing it in in a, in a a jazz club they're dancing and they're hearing the uh, attack of uh, Pearl, Pearl Harbor, Harbor yeah. on the radio those they're are on all a tank in, right in the middle of a battle they're in a battle with real tanks yeah it is extremely impressive and all the time of course you can look around and see what's happening behind you and next to you and if you watch this and by the way We've I've been uh, I've changed my mind on cardboard in that regard because um, I have a bunch of Google cardboards lying around from Sundance and uh, SVVR and when you watch this in Google Cardboard it's absolutely amazing you can look around and yeah, yeah. this is this is a low end uh, HMD Google Cardboard is but it's nonetheless completely compelling and like you said yeah. now they uh, intersperse a game footage in game footage also in 360. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this to me is, this is what VR and, and 360 video is going to be about. This is how our children are going to learn history. Um, you know, not watch another Fantastic World War II movie, not li read a book, not watch uh, some stuff. This discussed. is Ready Player One become real. The the kids will learn... The kids, will, the kids will learn um, history from a, from wargaming.net. Well, you know... <laughs> I want to jump out the window now. I'm sorry. It, it is going to be a matter of time before someone is going to get post-traumatic stress disorder from one of these experiences because 
um, for instance, there's one scene where you are in a in a in an operation room. You are standing there while nurses are fighting to save the life of a soldier. Um, that is going to be heavy duty stuff. If you are in a battle, you, you are in a war, and th these things are going to become so realistic. It's not going to be just video. It's going to be 360 video combined with VR or whatever they're going to call it. You're going to be in there. You're going to be able to walk and run along with these guys while they, you know while they're while you're being shot at. I mean, this is this is going ama going to do amazing stuff, and it's going to make World War II movies look very very boring. And it's going to make history lessons uh, unforgettable, which mm. what, which is what they should be. I just talked to a director friend of mine who's very skeptical that 360 videos are going to be uh, the big thing. That was an interesting conversation because, you know, I said I think document. When we're talking specifically about documentaries, yeah, there 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 is no going back. I think this is uh, this is the, the way forward. Yeah, well, some people say that we're going to have color in film. Are you crazy? It will never work. Well, that that was my argument, and he says, no way. People want to watch the screen in front. They don't want to turn their head. Well, sound in a film? Amazing. <laughs> it will never work. People don't want that. We're, we're happy with silent movies. <laughs> okay, listener. <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I you, you know, I, I went to film school mm -hmm. for four years. I graduated. I had a production company. I've made movies. I've made television. Um, I can tell you that this is what people want. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely what people want. I would rather spend, uh, you know, a couple of minutes inside an operation room uh, set in World War II and just look around and see what is happening instead of someone uh, filming something, a reconstruction, and telling me um, about, about what's happening and showing me what they want me to see. You know, I want to go walk around. I want to look what's there and there. I want to see it myself, and it's going to make a much bigger uh, impact on me. Okay, but we're talking about two different things and this yes. th this is the problem always because we we conflate 360 videos with uh, VR. So a 360 video is still a passive experience but you see everything in 360. It so, is it is it is a, a less of a passive experience than watching a non 3D. Oh, video. oh, I agree with you but my friend's point was uh, that when you watch when you sit down and commit to watching a documentary let's specifically talk about documentary not narrative film then he, his argument was that you won't be um, interested in you know you always kind of basically he says it's too stressful to uh, always like think, oh, I'm missing something if I'm not like looking around, and then basically people would have to watch the film five times and they look in the other direction. Well, you know that 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 is the problem we have uh, when you're a director is that you need to adapt, you need to uh, you know increase your game. You've got to work with what you've got. You got new tools. Here you go. You you got new options. You got to go figure out how they work. If you want to make sure that whoever is watching your 360 video uh, documentary that they see what you want them to see, that they learn what you want them to learn. And you know what? It's actually quite simple. Then it you've got to make sure that the attention is grabbed. You know, for instance, if you're watching this, uh, you know, this operation scene in World War II where they're fighting to save this soldier, if I want to teach you the technology that these nurses are using, um, you should have one of them say, uh, come over here and look at this. You know, it sounds basic, but you've got to, you've got to adapt. You've got I completely to agree. Actually, I, th I think that the general uh, solution to focusing attention is actually quite simple. It comes through dialogue and audio. Yeah. So if an audio and cue comes absolutely. from the left, then you turn your head to the left, and that's where the action continues. I mean, it's really quite straightforward. Yeah, absolutely. And the best thing is, is that you can watch this documentary and the nurse can say to you, come over here and look at this and that's learn right. something. Um, but then you can watch it another time. Not because you have to, because you missed something, but because you want to look at it from a different angle or you want to go and ignore the nurse and see what's happening on another table. Hmm. You know what? I don't really care as long as they make the next 24 with Jack Bauer in 360. <laughs> oh, it will be Jack saying, Drax, Drax, hold my hand. Let's go and beat some people up. That's the future where I can insert myself. So it's a 360 video, but at the same time, it's VR and interactive. It's like, it's, oh God. Yeah. Oh, you'll be torturing scary foreign types for hours. <sighs> no, so I romantic. Would, <laughs> I would torture the investment banker who lives on the, uh, on the first floor just below me because he's an, okay, let's no, not talk wouldn't. about that. You would just be asking Jack to take off his shirt all the time. <laughs> All right, so we, we got to move on. Little music break real quick. Flick of the wrist. Uh, 
which is a <laughs> which is a Second Life version of a parody of a move of a video. I'm not kidding you. I'm not saying anything. So th this is like three times removed. So there's a rapper uh, apparently I don't know him. Cheddar the Connect is his name, and he made a song called Flick of the Wrist, and then they made a parody. Uh, Jay Static made a parody with Freddy Krueger and uh, mixed around the lyrics a little bit. And now Black Magic of Second Life fame made a music video uh, version of the Freddy uh, version. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> say that it's, it's funny. But um, please, guys, make original music videos in SL, would you? So we can yeah, play. You know, like, like that one from Berlin. Yeah, but the the music is it's not original music though. It's, it used to be. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, originally it was. All right, yeah, here's. No, you're right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Here's flick of the wrist uh, from uh, Black Magic and J Static and Cheddar the Connect. I showed up killing cause you was in your room. I showed up killing cause you chose to snooze. Look at the flick of the wrist. 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 I showed up killing cause you was in your room I showed up killing cause you chose to snooze uh, Some kids in a sleep try to run from me Some parents on Elm Street burned and murdered me Kill a kid with these fingers, take them down I'm my own mini act cause my daddy gone Murder spree, that's all I see Look at the flick of the wrist, got him on me I'm a soul stealer, I'm a soul stealer Gonna warn you now, don't fall asleep, kill ya Never quit, mister, kill your bitch, mister You better duck, fool, or you'll get split quicker Shiny blade, shiny blade, shiny blades I showed up killing cause you was in your room I showed up killing cause you chose to snooze Look at the figure of the wrist Look at the figure of the wrist Look at the figure of the wrist Look at the fuck of the wrist Look at the figure of the wrist Look at the figure of the wrist Look at the figure of the wrist Look at the fuck of the wrist That was flick of the wrist <laughs> I'm getting really heavily into hip hop now. All right, oh. but let, let's finally move to our uh, series of feature interviews from SVVR. And before we go to audio relating to high fidelity, let's play a few minutes of my interview with Graham Gaylor from VR Jet uh, Chat, uh, Joe, because I've been dismissing this little world, uh, but I was was actually quite impressed. And lo and behold, Gunter S. Thompson from Gunter's Universe, which is a talk show in VR chat, which we poked gentle fun at uh, in the past, has invited me on his show, and uh, I'll bring you along too. Well, maybe that's why I have to kiss their butts. But anyway, here's Graham Gaylor from VR Chat, uh, telling us a little bit more what VR Chat actually is. So VR Chat's a platform for creating and publishing social VR games. Uh -huh. So our users who want so to... So it is more than chat. Oh, yeah. So the name goes back to its very early origins, when it was just voice communication in a single room. But from there, users quickly wanted to bring in their own avatars. They wanted to build their own rooms. They wanted to interact in those rooms. So that's the direction we've started going. Mm -hmm. So today... We have over 500 uh, user-created worlds, all of which are built in Unity. Mm -hmm. So if a user wants to create content uh, for VR chat, they basically go into Unity, they build out their environment the way they normally would in Unity. They can either go to the asset store or build it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they can use our tool set uh, to add in uh, interactivity in those worlds. We have some drag and drop scripts that allow you to pick up objects and network sync them. Uh, and then when they're done building that world, we basically give them a giant publish button. Mm -hmm. When they press that button, it pushes it to the VR chat app instantly. You know, this is awesome. It's, I feel really like one of those guys who bitches about a movie that he hasn't seen. But now I'm doing it because I'm like, ah, VR chat. I mean, what's the big deal? I'm going to put an HMD <laughs> and I can do that in SL, but without an HMD. But what you're saying is, I mean, it's really uh, so much more. And, and you can also bring in your avatars. or you, of course, you can custom avatars, custom environments, custom that is important. 
But the big thing, so Second Life has obviously been around a very long time. With VR support, it can do a lot. The challenge there, and of course with uh, Project Sansar and High Fidelity, mm -hmm. um, you know, it wasn't built for VR. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to take something that's not built for VR and turn it to VR. You can do it, but it's not going to be a great experience. Small correction, uh, Project Sansar is. Oh, it is. It, it is. Oh, no, it was, sorry, it, I meant Project it, it, right. Sansar and High Fidelity. Uh, right, 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 right. But your competitor then is, in, in essence... High fidelity and oh, yeah. also these other and oh, all yeah. space. We're all, we're all in the same social realm, but we're all doing something a little bit different and targeting different audiences. How many people can be in the same space? And are we talking about rooms versus worlds, or is that something? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about expand uh, right. the expansive so, space. So terminology, rooms and worlds are pretty much the same thing right now. Yeah. Um, in terms of how many users can be in a world, everything is free yeah. um, at this point in time. Uh, so it's really just limited by the tech. So mm -hmm. since we do provide or allow for custom avatars, mm -hmm. if you have a lot of high poly avatars, you're going to lose performance. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have things in place that say, hey, when I'm building my world, I only want to allow avatars of this um, uh, you know, level of polys. Yep. Uh, so if you have a ton of low level polys, uh, polyed avatars, then you know, in theory you could have hundreds of avatars in the same yep. space. Yep. And of course we do clever things to make sure that um, you know, if it's, everybody's very spread out, things render better. So it doesn't matter on your platform, I guess, if I have an entire planet versus the interior of a, of a kitchen just because I'm looking right. at that. Does that matter at all? So right now the way it's structured, and this may change in the future, is essentially when you launch the app, mm -hmm. you have this menu system. Mm -hmm. And each in the menu system shows basically all the virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. These virtu virtual worlds could be as simple as an apartment room mm -hmm. or as broad as an entire planet. Mm -hmm. All these things are built in Unity. Mm -hmm. So of course the planet's going to be a bigger file mm -hmm. than the, uh, the, in the apartment, mm -hmm. but really they're, they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. Under the covers. And how do I get into it? I mean, if I have an HMD of my choice, how do I find it? Do I download it? Where is it? How is yeah, it distributed? Uh, so we work on the Oculus Rift and Vive. We also work uh, just on the monitor. So 2D desktop is also available. Mm -hmm. um, right now, you can download it for free at vrchat.com. So that is actually cool. So I can actually, if I don't have for whatever, I'm on the road, I don't carry my Vive with me, I can still hang out with my friends just in 2D uh, through mediated through a regular screen. Of a exactly. Okay. So obviously not, not as cool as VR, but you still got the voice chat. You can still you know join in other people's creations or create your own until you can get your headset and actually experience being there. In terms of anonymity or pseudonymity, I'm a big fan and I've seen documenting in Second Life that there's a lot of people who don't feel comfortable with the real name policy that Facebook, for example, sort of enforces. Sure. Uh, and it doesn't mean that they're terrorists or weirdos. They just don't want to be like all out there. What do you allow in here? I mean, how do I, can I, do I have like agency of identity? Can I call myself whatever? I mean, there's always a flip side to it. Of course. Uh, right now, I mean, but, we, since we are um, a startup and you're trying to build this as quickly as possible with the community in mind, um, it's very basic. If you have a username mm -hmm. that, if it's available, you can, you can grab, um, and that's really your name. Okay. Um, in the future, we probably want to move to a more, uh, your username is probably your email, and you know, then you can change your name if you whatever whatever you want to display to the world. Potentially down the line. You wait until you got a bunch of trolls. Uh. Yeah, that's a big challenge. Is you know, no one has the perfect solution to that. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. We'll do the best we can. So that was Graham Gaylor from VR Chat, but now High Fidelity, arguably the VR world furthest along in the bunch. Brad Heftegau is a hacker punk, uh, according to his LinkedIn profile, and he's been with High Fidelity since 2013. I spoke to him after uh, Jasmine from High Fidelity gave me a demo at SVVR. And let me tell you, uh, Joe, I know we've been in there a while back, but it was really quite impressive. Uh, with the HTC Vive controllers, I was able to interact with, with the objects in the environment. I was able to write on the whiteboard with a marker. And here, here it comes. I could create uh, prims. Oh. Uh, I, I keep calling them prims um, until the cows come home. And I could interact with them and toss them to other people uh, in, in the space. And they could then interact with, with, with those same objects. So uh, That is interesting. You'll see it. Uh, we'll link to uh, Philip Rosedale demoing it live at SVVR. And also, the what's it, what was interesting, the avatars that they used for the demo were very realistic based on scans. They did with a very sophisticated camera array from uh, uh, XX Array. Uh, we had uh, Molly Quans on last year from, from uh, XX Array or Blue Vision or whatever they're called. They have two different names. They shoot with 64 cameras, and that's the avatars that came from that um, 
uh, from that process. Anyways, I uh, asked uh, Brad a little provocatively how far Hi-Fi ha has gotten uh, along, or rather, have they gotten far enough for a noob like me who wants to come in world after work and enjoy it without having to troubleshoot the configuration for an hour yeah. or, or get the avatar dress and not fall through the floor. Um, basically, in other words, is Hi-Fi plug and play it and here's Brett have to go. This experience that you were just experiencing, this home, this particular home environment is uh, comes now built in to the sandbox environment that ah, the installer includes. Okay. So one of the things that we've changed recently and this is definitely uh, the idea to help give the you, the user, yeah. a sense of your home, your sandbox where you're able to, to play around. Yeah. And um, so this is that experience that you were having is something that's, that's come so built So I can really into. grab it in, in, in the market place and I can put it on my own uh, actually, domain? Actually, if you run the latest installer, the beta installer mm -hmm. um, that's available today, you'll, and you install the sandbox piece mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. the sandbox is your home environment and it will be all that content by default. Amazing. And people will immediately be able to come in and join you. You see around the home, there's a lot of instructions on the wall. Mm -hmm. And there's another room that we didn't go into where there's actually videos on computers on the table that if you walked up to that and you clicked it, you'd be getting a tutorial video. And so one of the things we're going to keep doing is we're obviously working on this we're still only just now in beta and we're going to continue to build in a very the the, the tutorial environment the help mm -hmm. getting started environment is all going to be in world and that experience that is really great so you are in world while you're getting that tutorial right um, how many people are uh, working now at high fidelity approximately you don't I don't need different uh, numbers. we have about 20 people on, uh -huh. on the staff I know there's in-world creation tools, and, and, and that discussion is going on in the Second Life community, also with, with Project Santa coming on. Do you feel that in-world creation, is the era of in-world creation, is it over? Are people going to create offline and then upload it into the space? With, with, with Unity and with, with, with Unreal now, you can... You can create in in world again. So we sort of see it as to we see we sort of see it as kind of sometimes you're going to want to create outside of the world using tools that that are much more high end uh, 3D graphics tools, um, and sometimes you're going to want to create in world. And so we kind of are trying to blend those two things together. Mm -hmm. um, all the models that you were experiencing, those were all built externally. Yeah. Those were using tools like you know. Um, you know, uh, Maya or whatever, you know, or maybe they come off of Turbo Squid or something like that. But then the fact that they were placed in the world and they were in that room and the chair was sitting in a particular place and there was the cuckoo clock on the wall and the mm -hmm. books were on the shelf, all of that stuff was actually done in world. Our, wow. You know, our, our, a combination of folks like Jasmine, who are the artists, and other mm -hmm. folks like Eric and, J and uh, James, who are, are kind of more of our content developer, scripter mm -hmm. types guys, mm -hmm. they built this environment and... Um, in world, they built it. The, the reason I'm asking is because the the, the empowering nature. I mean, I think what, what what was transformative about Second Life and still is for 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 people who are in world is the fact that you can build together. in in together in real time. And I'm a yeah. little concerned that so that concept clearly, might be abandoned. No, no. Well, clearly that's a big piece of what we're doing, and mm -hmm. and and part of that is that. Um, there's a very fine line. There's a there's there's essentially no line between you and I standing in the room picking up apples and handing right. them to each other, right. and you and I standing in world and creating and editing together. Yep. The, the the technology that makes either of those things possible is the exact same technology. Mm -hmm. um, we've taken the approach of saying we're building a platform, mm -hmm. and um, that platform can be used to do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And we've made the conscious choice of doing things like our in world editing tools mm -hmm. when you when you first install the product we have an edit edit tool that comes with the mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. that's actually written in javascript mm -hmm. and it's written in a, a manner that we we basically intend for people to say oh okay this is usable to for me to edit in world but if somebody else gets the you know a spark of inspiration to say no i'm going to change this to add more editing features mm -hmm. we focused on building the platform that lets you build the tools mm -hmm. and that lets you interact together and and sort of so I, i'm not at all concerned about the idea yeah. of 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 interactive real-time building yeah. because our system is designed 100% around that idea. That's, that's, that's something that people speculate in the Second Life community with Project Sansa. There's a lot of anxiety in, in the Second Life community who, who want to get uh, into Project Sansa. Have they abandoned it uh, completely? And so, so they, well, we think, they'll, they'll make a... We think that, like, it's... I mean, the idea of building that cuckoo clock, that's a very intricate model. And you probably don't want to be in world to build that because people like Ozon for example or Jasmine who are experts in modeling 
you know, they they they, they need a, a very large tool set to mm-hmm. really build really detailed models, mm-hmm. and and that's that's Maya's domain. You know, that's the domain of those types of high end three D graphics models. But it would be so cool if it were we all integrated. Well, I think. But then that, on the other hand, who would who would stand there sweating in a in a yeah, in a headset and, for twelve hours? Yeah, and honestly, I'm I'm you know I'm a developer, not an artist, and for me, it's I, if I can go to Turbo Squid and grab grab fifteen awesome models mm-hmm. and then put them in my environment and and then I can then when I'm in the environment I can manipulate those models and I can script those models or I can ch- I can place those models around my house mm-hmm. I'm I am building in world mm-hmm. but I'm not I'm not trying to learn some 3D modeling tool right. But again, I mean, but you, but you're a developer. You can look at you can well, look I, at the I, numbers I, and where, where I, I would of, go nuts. I'm a musician. Yeah, yeah. So I sort of think of it like the real world. It's yeah. like I want to go to IKEA and buy a, a piece of furniture yeah. and put it in my living room. Maybe I want to arrange my living room, but I don't necessarily want to build the furniture. But that's you. Some people want to Some have a saw, to, and then they want to have and, glue, and they want to have. Yeah, and so that's uh, great. So what do you see in the in the near future? I mean, now just. The headsets are just now sort of become, becoming available on a, on, a, on, a, on a grand scale this year. But do you think that how people? I mean, people can use high fidelity, obviously, uh, on on a, on a flat screen. They don't have to wear the headset all day long. If you were to speculate uh, where, where the train is headed, I mean, I, I honestly, I'm very enthusiastic about it, but I don't know if I could wear a headset longer than. I don't know, right now, 15 minutes. The, the HTC yeah. Vive is, is fairly comfortable, but, but I still don't see it wearing it longer than 15 minutes. You know, um, I mean, I'm in World all, all day because... But I, not with I, a headset. Well, what, let me, yeah, so let me speak to that. So, um, you know, I live in Seattle, and um, and Austin, our other one of our other developers, we live in Seattle. We're, we work together every day, mm-hmm. and we never see each other except for when we come down to San Francisco or when we're in World. Mm-hmm. And I would say that, you know, uh, often I'm in the headset, and sometimes I just have the the 2D display running and it kind of depends on what I'm doing in that moment Mm -hmm. but absolutely as you well you just experienced Mm -hmm. it is a much more engaging immersive uh, frankly in in my opinion enjoyable experience when you're actually in there and you you you, you really see the the dimensionality and you really get immersed Um, and that's what that experience is for but we're going to always have a. We're, I mean, clearly our platform is uh, intended to be used in all of these different devices. You mentioned so. dimensionality, it's actually a good point because that's something that really contributes to, to, to the sense of presence that the, everything seems to be really, really accurate in terms of dimensions scale. and scale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what, that's, I think that's completely true. Okay, uh, final question, but maybe, maybe uh, Philip would answer that, but maybe you can. Do you feel that people will hand over their machines, like the, the, the concept at a grand scale to really the, the build that metaverse? Or, out. Yeah, or do you feel, is, is there not a possibility that people won't do that? What, what's the incentive well, for them to do first that? First of all, I think that we, th- we look at it in a couple different ways. The first thing is we, 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 we built our system intentionally to be uh, more like Apache and the mm-hmm. Mozilla of virtual reality instead of the AOL of, of virtual reality, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So instead of being a hosted environment where everything is kind of walled, garden and controlled, we said, no, we're going to build an you know, open source server, open source client, and, and people can run those wherever the environment that they want. This experience that we were having right here happens to be in a confined, closed network. We're not connected to the internet, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So in that sense, from day one, our philosophy has been that you can control that server, mm-hmm. and you can put whatever content on that you Excellent. want, and you can put you can put whatever sort of uh, usage requirements around that that you want to, because it is a server. Just like when you're running a web server, you know you control that, right? That is so. Good. Mm-hmm. So in that sense. That's so I could dock on to the metaverse, but I don't have to. You don't have to, mm-hmm. right? So, so we think that's an important, important distinction between mm-hmm. high fidelity and some of the other uh, systems that have come before us, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Um, now, it's also the case that we built our t- system from a technology perspective to have all these small little server nodes mm-hmm. that do a little part of the job. Mm-hmm. And we do believe that um, there will be a benefit to people saying, hey, I've got some spare compute time, and I'm willing to contribute my server to um, this other experience. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, 
you know, a whole group of people could get together and say, we're going to build a bigger, expansive environment that wouldn't work on just one machine. Right. But collectively, between the five of us, we will be able to have our collection of machines mm -hmm. create this bigger environment. Mm -hmm. And our system is, has been designed from day one to have that sort of distributed network aspect to it. And that's also a way to... Uh, to get paid, right? I mean, that's what I understood. So that's our long-term kind of vision is absolutely to create this marketplace for compute power. Mm -hmm. And 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 so um, we don't have that system online yet, but an aspects of our, our metaverse services that we're going to provide mm -hmm. will allow you to basically say, hey, I've got some free compute time. I'm going to go ahead and volunteer to be an assignment client. Mm -hmm. That's what we call it in our in the techno uh, mm -hmm. language of our, mm -hmm. our, our platform. And um, eventually, maybe your server will be the audio server for somebody's um, um, you know, club or something like that mm -hmm. that they've built in. Mm -hmm. Currency. What's the plan of of payment? I I, I kind of lost. I there were there were several announcements, but is there going to be an in world currency like the Linden dollar, or is it? Uh, uh, is that even necessary? Is that an outdated concept? Yeah, we're still, we're, still trying to, we're still looking into what we're going to do in that regard. Obviously, the goal is to make it as, as easy as possible, to make yeah. it as secure as possible, yeah. and, to, and to and enable these types of applications that we're talking about. All right, there you have it. The goal is to make it easy. And, the, and I guess the question is, is the Hi-Fi open source uh, route the, the, the way to go? Or is the closed approach of Linden Lab the, the way to go? You know, when Sansa rolls out, it might be like a BMW, the ultimate driving machine with total 100% around-the-clock service, which you pay for. What do you prefer, Joe? Um, I prefer a combination. I prefer a virtual world that is first closed so that whoever is building it can concentrate and make, you know, make whatever they want, get it to work, get it to look flashy and shiny instead of something that a bunch of, uh, you know, amateurs like you and me have built. And then once it's all working and people start flooding in, then you make it open source, a bit like Second Life, so people can make their own viewers or something like that. As I mentioned at the top of the hour, High Fidelity held a uh, three-day hackathon. Uh, well, it started Friday after the SVVR, and, and winners were announced Sunday, 3 p.m. at the Upload VR Collective. Uh, I was at the hackathon, and Ozan uh, Serum, who was in charge of the avatars at High Fidelity, scanned people's heads with a simple camera, depth camera, and his colleague Jimmy Hume, who's a 3D artist at High Fidelity, cleaned them up and uh, rigged, rigged the avatars, and they were basically testing a workflow. Well, so I'm working with Jimmy. One thing mm -hmm. I want to know, so the two of us are tag teaming mm -hmm. on generating avatars, and we're trying to do them really fast. Like our goal is volume, mm -hmm. fast uh, and easy. So what we're doing is taking uh, raw scan data, uh, putting it through a rigging process, mm -hmm. doing a textured beauty pass, and then pack packaging it up for high fidelity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, that's mm -hmm. what we're doing. And you said your goal was uh, kind of, you, you said this goal maybe 20 minutes per avatar yes. or something like that? Yes, mm -hmm. and I think we've achieved that actually. We mm -hmm. did, we, you know, for um, a single iteration from scan to getting in high fidelity, we do it in about that time. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that we're learning along the way is how to achieve quality and mm -hmm. what areas to focus on, what things mm -hmm. really matter. So of course the eyes, the mouth, the skin texture, the silhouette of the uh, geometry, all that stuff really contributes to something that is appealing. What tools do you need? Uh, what, are, what is part of the uh, part of the workflow from uh, start to finish? You have a camera. Just yeah. step through the through the items. Sure. So we have a prime sense camera that's using depth information to generate a point cloud. Mm -hmm. That point cloud is being used by phase shift to uh, wrap onto a piece of geometry, mm -hmm. and we lament the kind of the, the loss of phase shift in some ways because mm -hmm. it got acquired by Apple, yeah. and now we don't know its future. Yeah. But in the meantime, while I have this license, I'm going to use it, and then we'll find something else to use. You know, in the in the future. But for now, it's a really great tool for wrapping geometry onto a point cloud. Uh, then when we have that, we export the OBJ with a UV map, mm -hmm. and I hand that off to Jimmy, and Jimmy does a bunch of stuff. You could ask him. Pretty much what I do with the avatars once I receive the face scan is go in, open, it, uh, open up the face texture and the OBJs over in ZBrush, and I go in and I paint out all of the, uh, the blotchiness of the, and the artifacting of the scans and clean it up so that it looks more like them. And I uh, add in like specific features that I've taken photos of them of, and so we can get the nice textures and the likeness. And then I put it into Maya, put it through Maya, get the head and the textures all correct, and then we put it on a base body that we've already made through uh, through Fuse. Yeah, yeah. Then I take that um, constructed asset and we we wrap it in a um, in a high fidelity specific. Mm -hmm. Uh, package. Mm -hmm. It's basically um, has a mapping system that tells high fidelity what the rig is and mm -hmm. how to drive it. Mm -hmm. It tells it about the bones. It tells it about the animation. 
things like that, and also tells about the blend shapes. Then we put it in high fidelity, we give it to the, um, to the gang, and they use it, they drive it around, and that's the idea. I'm really impressed also with the fact that you guys put very realistic avatars in there. To me, this proves that we, ha we have to A, go this route, because it, uh, people stick with it when, when they have some realism, some stake in the avatar, and yeah. also it also proves to me that maybe the Uncanny Valley thing is, yeah, it's a little bit of a... Of a, of a cop out not to kind of deal with it, I yeah. guess. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, obviously it does. Right, right, uh, exactly. I was gonna say that my thoughts on that, you know, based on your question, is that the Uncanny Valley is real, it exists, we have to deal with it in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, we are doing photoreal avatars. We're using a team in LA called Blue Vishnu, mm -hmm. also called XXR. I, I know. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, they have a great rig. One thing that I was kind of crossed my mind based on what you're saying is that there's a sense of identity in that mm -hmm. scan. So you really recognize that person. Yeah. And if that were you, then you would definitely feel engaged and identify, invested Absolutely. in that avatar for sure. And then I can dress up on top of it, but underneath, I know just like when I go to Halloween, yeah. I don't get surgery for Halloween, I put some stuff on top of myself. Yeah. So you still identify with the character. Yep. The, um, the business of the Uncanny Valley is. Right now, it's I, for me. This is very difficult to understand what attributes contribute to it. Yeah. But right now, there's some elements that are so clearly not realistic, like the animation and yep. the Hydra, the hand controllers. You have these kind of Muppet-style movements, so it's right. clearly not. Right. But you have some photoreal elements. One thing I can tell you is that people are responding really well to the photoreal yep. avatars. They're very intrigued by it. Uh, so we'll, we'll see though, there still is a, a group of folks that prefer the stylized, cartoony one, yeah. but well, this experiment of having a scan booth is to figure out how we can get to that photo real quality with, uh, at a low cost, mm -hmm. and what elements that people really respond to. Mm -hmm. Because the photo real avatars are not uh, an exact simulation of that person, they yeah. are uh, you know, they're an artifice of some kind. So anyway, right. we want to figure out how we can achieve that with some lower end technology. So there you go, and I hope to get to play with my special uh, Drax Hi-Fi avatar very soon. Ozan promised to, to whip him into shape as fast as he can, and I hope we can then all meet in the Uncanny Valley. Uh, now, I have one last piece of uh, tape from uh, High Fidelity because I bumped into Dr. Fran Babcock from Second Life, who many listeners may know, and she was on a team with a Dutch guy by the name of Thoys, and uh, Billy Brown, and uh, I think Devin Allen is is another guy from Second Life, and um, they were uh, part of the hackathon theme, and they made pretty cool things. Uh, we're linking to a um, to a highlight reel also on the on the blog. Uh, so let me play this short conversation with Dr. Fran. I asked her about also the current state of high fidelity, where it argues you still need a lot of JavaScript. I guess uh, she agreed with that uh, that you must have that skill. To, oh to be part of the game. I can't script. I can't script myself out of a paper bag. So if you can't do that, then you really are at a disadvantage. But that's the whole idea of a team. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have another person who isn't here today but was here yesterday mm -hmm. um, because he lives in the area. Um, is, would have been part of our team. Um, you know, it really is very good at JavaScript. So you surrounded yourself with very talented people here. Um, Toys is, he never gets enough credit. He mm -hmm. came here all the way from Holland to mm -hmm. do this. And he really is, he just, he doesn't even, we've been working all week and he just said, okay, just, when you're ready, just let me know. And he's mm -hmm. going to script the interaction for the, mm -hmm. the game that we're, we're setting up. Um, it ends up being a lot harder than I think. But because of but Second it's possible. Life, anything, mm -hmm. anything you can think of, you can mm -hmm. do. That's, to me, that's always been the draw for Second mm -hmm. Life and mm -hmm. for High Fidelity. And if you look what they're doing now, they started, you see, they put my start. I'm the person who makes the entities for them. So I made the start, I made the hoops that, um, because, because of Second Life, I've learned how to do Blender, mm -hmm. you know, and Photoshop and mm -hmm. all those other things. It's, it's, it's absolutely mind boggling the direction that you go in when you follow the things you're passionate about. I and agree. that's in any area, it's not just in virtual worlds. And it's not, it's not very user-friendly, but then it's for the people who are willing to go to the extra effort to do this. By and it's a work in progress. We really got to totally. kind of... I mean, um, it just came out of Alpha. It mm -hmm. just became beta at SVBR. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that still means a lot of work to do. So what do you think about the, the closed approach of Project Sansar versus this approach? Is there one better than the other, or... Well, I only we don't have know. one sentence. I do not have $6,000 to buy Maya. Mm -hmm. and Blender's free, and I'm pretty good at Blender. So 
so high fidelity is for me. And also, this is Philip Rosedale. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I admire Philip a lot. I think he's a visionary. I think he gets it. Mm-hmm. I think that he takes his inspiration from sources like, you know, Ready Player One is really the inspiration for High Fidelity. Mm-hmm. And it's a great book. I've read it twice, and I think it's a lot of fun. And I love the whole thing of this. We're in the world. I'm, you know, I'll be honest with you, I'm going to be 65 years mm-hmm. old. Mm-hmm. Where would I be hanging out with people like this? Because this is, but this is what I'm interested yeah. in, and we, and we all get along, regardless yeah. age, where you're from, your beliefs, anything. We come to Project, I Project Center. By the way, Beta, I'll let you talk. It, it, they allow Blender now. M- Maya was only in the very beginning. One Didn't of sign up for the Beta, so maybe I should do it. <laughs> Anyway, you were saying you met what? No, I mean, I mean, I met somebody here who I know for eight years in Second Life and High Fidelity mm-hmm. and met for the first time. And it's like we knew each other all. You yeah. know, I mean, th- there's no difference between people yeah. don't understand that. Yeah. My friends at home think I'm, you know, I've heard that you was talk my about next that. Question. People think I'm crazy mm-hmm. and, and they don't realize the riches of this. When you don't have the physical person there, intimacy is a whole different level mm-hmm. because you don't have the, you know, I'm not distracted. I'm, not just, I'm listening to you. I'm talking to you. Mm-hmm and you get to know people on a level that you never get to in first life. Um, and then when you meet in first life, it's... I know you're anxious to get out because there's a deadline. I know there is. And I'm actually but sent... They don't really... I'm, I'm sent here by Linden Lab to boycott, to sabotage everything. Oh, is that your job? <laughs> so you're gonna no, no, no. If you want to sabotage it, you got to pull him. <laughs> no, I'm not here to sabotage uh, anything. I want virtual worlds to succeed creative places that level the playing field and if we get that done we're good to go right joe leveling the playing field is all there all it counts virtual world for dummies that's what we need there's definitely a second life for dummies book still in the from from dummy seer for dummy series you can get that book for now so yeah we'll be uh, monitoring high fidelity but um that's the end of the show we're we're, we're going over time again uh Uh-oh. joe uh what's uh what's up for the weekend is there are there any plans well, we are going to prepare the seventh anniversary of the 1920s Berlin Project. Ooh. Seven years. Amazing, isn't it? It is absolutely amazing. And how can you do that since virtual reality started in 2013? I don't know. I, 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 I thought I lived in a virtual city, but then I saw a video that says they were the first and it's not even finished. <laughs> <laughs> complicated, complicated. But that will be for the end of this month. So uh, we'll be talking about that in the next episode a little bit more in detail. And and I did send you a link, and you should play that uh, in world uh, at the birthday celebration. It's basically radio.com, but radio with one, two, three, four, five O's. Radio.com. And what you can do, you can click on a country on the world map, and you can click on a decade, and it will play music from that country from that decade. It's awesome. Yeah, but we only have one country in one decade in our scene. So, <sighs> yeah. Authenticity über alles. <laughs> um, yeah, and also uh, I want to mention uh, the hashtag because of Second Life. Uh, we started that uh, Strawberry Sing and I started that on um, on Twitter, not on on Second Life. Because of Second Life is the hashtag where people have. Um, done some really funny things, but also some really kind of heartfelt things where people said, because of Second Life, I met the love of my life and we've been married for eight years. Or uh, somebody posts a um, a clock and says, uh, because of Second Life, I think this clock is an SLT. Or I don't know what you posted, something. Uh, uh, because of Second Life, I've finally been able to travel back in time, see a Zeppelin fly and share my passion for history with the world. Very boring. It's really boring. Where is your uh, trademark? I don't know. And I, you know, I haven't even mentioned the latex and kinky stuff that apparently we're all into. Right. And I just realized that uh, I haven't even tweeted because of Second Life. I believe I'm Jack Bauer. Because of Second Life, I've uh, I've gained a new int- uh, understanding of what lag could do. Because of Second Life, I gained 150 pounds. Only, only 95. <laughs> all right. So that's it for today. We go out with a little audio from Kelly Tony from the Upload Collective. I mentioned her earlier. She was the um, uh, the office manager. She recently changed positions, but I, it was a great conversation I had at the High Fidelity Hackathon. Uh, the Upload Collective was started by Taylor Freeman. It's kind of an office space, and uh, but with a philosophical uh, bent. Uh, here's little uh, Kelly Tony with some chill music underneath. I, I don't know if it's chill, whatever it is. 
guys. Thanks for listening. And Joe, have a great weekend and goodbye. Over to Zen. So the collective, I'd like to categorize it as a co-working space slash think tank. A collective of very genuine and authentic people who are extremely enthusiastic about VR and AR and all that it can offer this world. And they're coming together to share ideas and help advance the industry. People can come in and they can uh, test out their content, their uh, software. They can also come in and, and experience VR for the first time. Yeah. And when I let them know that this is something that can scale across uh, healthcare education to healthcare to uh, you know architecture to real estate, I mean the applications are endless. It's not just gaming and ed tech. Um, I think it starts to pique their curiosity, and they really want to get a tangible experience with it. And it's unfortunate that it's not as widely available as we w- would want it now, but it's certainly come a long way. Um, last weekend, I was in Oakland, my favorite city, and um, I, the T-Mobile at uh, Lakeshore had the Samsung um, uh, mobile the exhibit, store. the mm-hmm. trucks, the truck mobile oh, exhibit, okay. the one that comes. And that's a, that's a cool hangout in uh, Oakland. They have their big farmer's market plug uh, there every Saturday. Ah. And so they were able to capture a lot of people from the area and give them their first VR experience. Oh, and I, I think see. more of this is needed. Yeah. And people need to, first of all, get to see it, touch it, feel it. And then we need more um, education. And it's not... It's like selling way. weed at the elementary <laughs> school, yeah, I understand. No, it's not one. Not just one-way education. It needs to be a two-way, because these are the types of people that are going to be using it. And we could use their feedback. But if they're not getting access to it, how are they, we going to get their feedback? It's like coding blind. There's a fear of withdrawing. It's not necessarily no, no, like I total matrix, it. but yeah. it's like we're withdrawing from this and the kids are already uh, uh, addicted to whatnot. The and, text uh, and everything. I mean, you can text all day, all night long, you yeah. know, with the virtual reality. Isn't it a two-hour cap? The Drag Files Radio Hour with Joe Yardley is a weekly production of Basic Tracks Entertainment. The show is supported by Extraordinary Fine Magical Goods, Ionic, Maven Homes, Giza Creations, Botanical, Strawberry Sing, Humanoid Animations, Abranimations, Eros Avatars, Caravel Design, The Cube Republic, The Avazines Publication Family, What Next, Dutchy Furniture, Landscapes Unlimited, Bay Cities You Know for Kids, Dwarfins, Fallen Gods Incorporated, Feroche SL, and Death Row Designs. Contact the show via Skype, Drax Files, Avatar, Drax Files, or email radio at draxfiles.com. Thank you.